When you hear the word refugee, who do you think of? I was sure that I was going to be the first Ethiopian American triple threat. So there's a part of this which is just like as a character, you can actually tend to feel like it's a little bit ignored, a little bit stepped on. When she said an orphan, I was like, ooh, are we really orphans? Are we really orphans? Mm. and American, um, but I've been living here in Kenya for eight years. By profession and training, I am an educationalist, um, focusing in the last decade specifically on Sub-Saharan Africa, but I've been fortunate to travel really all over Africa and in Asia, doing work around education, in particular mother tongue education. In the last few years, my focus has really shifted back to my first love, which is creative communications, and in particular, the intersection of creative communications and justice. So for me, that means I've created a podcast in this last year called Uproot, and Uproot really focuses on stories that highlight joy, resilience, and justice. And we look at that through stories of culture and identity, both here in Nairobi, as well as thinking about it much more globally. But besides all of my professional work, my proudest role definitely is being a mother of four wonderful kids and married to my college sweetheart for 20 years. So um, those are my proudest and most joyful parts of my life for sure. In Ethiopia, we start our storytelling by saying Teret Teret. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1976. And during that time, Ethiopia was really undergoing a political revolution. It, the monarchy had been overthrown by a socialist government and Addis Ababa in particular, but the entire country was really in crisis. Um, it was the middle of the communist regime. People were dying and being killed. Businesses were being closed. Universities and schools were being shut down. And during that time, my parents were fortunate enough to have assistance to go to the United States to complete their studies. Um, and so at the age of you know, a year and a half, my mother and I left Ethiopia and joined my father in the US. And because of the political situation back home, we weren't able to go back to Ethiopia and visit family or see, yeah, to, to really connect with that part of my heritage. But growing up from me in the US, my parents always instilled a very deep sense of Ethiopian identity. Um, they taught me our language. I was told all of our stories and our heroes, you know, I was very engaged, even though we never lived really within the diaspora in the US. We lived in North Dakota, in Indiana, these really small communities, but I always felt very connected to my Ethiopian identity. Um, if I fast forward then into college and in those years um, was where I met my husband and when we started off our lives together, we really thought that we would work within um, primarily you know, marginalized communities. I worked in education at the higher education level, that's where my master's is, and my husband taught in uh, Title I schools, which in the U.S. are schools that receive federal funding, so really the, the poorest schools. When I was growing up, up until the age of 16, I was sure that I was going to be the first Ethiopian American triple threat. Dancer, actress, and model. So, you know, when I was a kid, I think growing up in the U.S. as an immigrant, I was very aware of being different from the other kids. Um, on the one hand, I loved to eat like grilled cheese sandwiches and all these American things. But whenever I was in my house, it was very much like I'm in Ethiopia. You know, we ate our national food and we had this yeah, kind of constant sense of knowing who we were. And I think as I grew up, I was always aware um, of, the, of the difference and the duality that I lived in. As I got into like my early years, and I, I remember very distinctly in grade four, watching Oprah Winfrey on TV and seeing a black woman who was elegant and dynamic and also very silly and playful at times. 
and thinking that's who I want to be. That's that's the goal. That's it. And I, you know, again, we're, we were a little bit, you know, outside the cultural trends. And so I don't think I knew who she was or what she meant to American society at the time. But for me, she was really a symbol of something I aspire to be. And some of my early like report cards from teachers, they comment on how bright I was but very talkative and always had something to say in class and I remember getting in trouble in kindergarten in particular for like kissing a boy during show and tell and things like that just very gregarious and outgoing and I really credit my parents they they always said anything was possible for me they never tried to steer me like in one direction or the other in terms of you know we're immigrants this is what we do or whatever they really just let the sky be the limit so I studied communication in university and really thought that's where I'm headed. Um, I hosted a TV show on campus and I wrote um, in, you know, on campus in different publications and published poetry and really thought that's the path I'm going. Um, but my path really it wasn't linear like many people. Um, I met my husband during that time and really for the sake of like love I kind of shifted my thoughts and shifted my career aspirations. and. Pursuing communication went on hold and I took a job at a university that allowed me to be a little bit closer to Ben, my husband at the time, or still my husband today, but <laughs> at the time. Um, and so that kind of shifted me into a world of higher education that I didn't expect to go into. Um, but I really do believe that you know God has a path for us and I feel like nothing has been wasted in my life. Because in those years we had our kids and um, you know of course now you know, my, old, my oldest is 17. Now, of course, you look back and you have no regrets. But it definitely was a conscious decision to choose family and, and love over career at that juncture of my life. And at, as I went along, people would question that decision and certainly say, you know, this is a field for the young. You know, media is for the young. You know, you have to be able to hustle. You have to be able to pick up and move and follow the story. And so I knew at that time that's not what I wanted. I, I really did want to have a family, and that's what I chose. Um, but like I said, nothing is wasted, and so we pursued our graduate studies at, at Harvard, and I think having that experience really awakened in me um, my deep desire to be a social activist as well. We organized a lot politically. We organized, I organized with some friends a, a march on Washington to protest some affirmative action laws at the time that were being litigated at the Supreme Court. We were very active with Oxfam and some of the um, social kind of protest and resistance about the price of coffee that Starbucks at the time was controlling, which was really causing a depression on the Ethiopian market. And so we organized a lot with them to really push back against their monopoly on the market. So during those years where, you know, at the time we had three kids, so it was busy and we had a young, young family, but it was really clear to me that being engaged in my community would always be central to who I was. So when we finished our graduate work, we had an opportunity to go to Ethiopia to do further research. We left the U.S. for, for two reasons, I would say. One was I have some older cousins who were moving back. And at that time, really nobody was moving back to the continent from the diaspora. This was 13 years ago. Things politically were closed. Economically, there were not a lot of opportunities. But they felt called. They felt called by God to go back, to make a difference, to plant opportunities and community back home, really. Because, you know, even if you grow up in the U.S. and you have friends and, of course, you develop rich relationships, there's always something pulling you from home. And my parents raised me with that sense of whatever you do in life, no matter what profession, do something for others. If you're not doing something for others, think again about really how you should spend your energy and your talents. And so when we had the opportunity to go home to Ethiopia, it just made sense. We had had our fourth child. Um, we were tired, <laughs> um, but we were also eager to come home and learn and be a student of our own people um, in a way that I hadn't had the opportunity to be growing up outside of Ethiopia. So the first time I was able to go back to Ethiopia after we left in 1977 was in 1999. After I got married, we came back to celebrate with the family. At that point, politically, the communist regime was over and Ethiopia was a new democracy, but it was still uncertain times. Um, so we came back in 99 and it felt like a vacation. It just felt like, oh, we're going to a new place, really, because having never been back, for me, it was a new place. Um, it was very emotional. Um, we had family members who came to meet us at the airport who we had not seen, or my parents had not seen since they left. It was a really emotional and important trip. And I think a seed was planted when we went back in 1999 that really, if we ever have an opportunity, if my skills can ever be an asset, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. 
So when we moved back in 2007, though, I had four kids by then, so I was a different woman than I was in 1999. Uh, my kids were very young, four years old. I have twins, they were two and a half, and then a six week old. So even though they knew the US, it wasn't ingrained in them. I wouldn't say that they were really anything yet. They were just our kids. They hadn't really taken on a cultural identity per se. My husband is a black American and he had studied Amharic, our national language in school and had learned to read it. And his dissertation was entirely about the Ethiopian educational system. So I would say we were going back with a real sense of cultural identity, a real sense of kind of academic and intellectual knowledge. But actually living there, day to day experiencing the ins and outs of traditions, the cultural norms, the practice of faith was new for me and I took some time. I thought I was more Ethiopian than I really was and when I landed I realized I am not as Ethiopian as I thought. <laughs> and I had a lot to learn. And I, of course, we've gone back and forth between the U.S. and East Africa the last 13 years, and whenever I meet diaspora who are young Ethiopians, maybe who have never been to Ethiopia and were born in the States, I always tell them, you must go. There's nothing like going. There's nothing like looking around and seeing that every face is a mirror back to you of who you are. It's such a powerful and important part of developing your understanding of your country and yourself. Really, that's, that's what it was. Ethiopia was teaching me myself. And it took time, and it was hard. I found myself really on the outside of understanding just cultural habits. You know, I really realized how American I was. Uh, and it really was highlighted to me over and over again. And so I can say the four years we spent there were important, meaningful, and wonderful because we were around family. But it was, for me, personally hard. I had a lot of growing to do, a lot of learning to do. I'm still learning and still growing. But those years, it was like, you know, when you have that teacher who doesn't let you go? <laughs> it was like Ethiopia was not going to let me go until I had really understood, embraced, reflected, and practiced, you know, who I was. Um, and I'll always be grateful that we had those years. We, we moved to Kenya in 2011. My husband got an opportunity there, and by the time we were leaving, actually, I started teaching at an elementary school in Addis Ababa and, and loved it, surprisingly. It was not something I expected to do, but there was a sudden opening at the school, and the principal reached out to me, and, and I took on, on the job, and I loved it. It really was a beautiful experience. When we moved to Kenya, my consulting work really took off, and that's where I feel like I, it really started to blossom, and I've done lots of consulting for different programs. The Girls Education Challenge, which has been in about a dozen countries across Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a program from DFID. I, I worked extensively for them, doing lots of um, training all over the continent. I worked for RTI, I worked for UNICEF, um, and now I work at the World Bank as a senior communication strategist. So in some ways, a lot of my experiences are all coming to bear on what I do now, which is to tell stories about the impact of development work in all over Kenya, in all 47 counties, and how the health sector is growing, and how the partnerships between government and communities are so important, and, and really trying to share not only the successes, but the ways forward in, in really sometimes difficult situations. But really, for me, my passion, the, the things that kind of really keep me up at night are, are, the, are the stories that I've heard from friends and family members and people I respect who work really closely with children and human rights issues. And so through my podcast, I, I think I'm able to elevate those stories and tell those stories. Um, and in the last year, that's probably been a, hu a huge highlight for me, being able to really share the important work that so many people that I admire are doing to help others. And of course, when it came to eighth grade, because I knew I wanted to be a model, who do you think was vying and hoping and praying that she would be elected best looking black girl? Me. As a consultant at the World Bank, my work really has been to focus in, really laser in on the stories of impact in the health sector. So I work for a reproductive and maternal health trust fund that's really looking at how to decrease uh, maternal and perinatal death. That's the number one goal. How do we keep as many mothers healthy and as many children healthy? And to me, there, there's really nothing more noble than that. No woman should have to die because she had a child. And so what I'm doing in my work now is measuring the impact of our technical assistance, talking to beneficiaries and seeing how their lives have changed or improved talking to medical professionals and talking about the ways that they've strategically taken on new 
uh, partnerships or new ways of budgeting or planning or measuring incomes or sorry measuring outcomes and how that's benefited mothers and children that's really our focus and so as a communication specialist that's what I, I talk about all the time so every year on the new on New Year's I always write my goals for the year and every year for like the last 10 years it was get back to my my media and my communication roots get back to that Oprah Winfrey dream that I had when I was little. And to be honest with you, media still has several gatekeepers. And I, I'm a resident in this country, but I'm not a Kenyan. Um, and so I was sensitive to the fact that in this context, what could I access to share the stories that I think are important? And what can I do now? Because it got to be 2000, I turned 40 a few years ago, and like many people, you have a moment of self-reflection. And while I was a lot of places that I didn't expect to be, which were wonderful, I had not really taken a risk on myself. And that year, my only New Year's resolution was to have more regrets. I was like, I need to take so many risks this year that I have some regrets at the end of the year because I've played it so safe all these years and it's time to get out there. Podcasting for me was appealing for many reasons. Number one, it travels with you anytime. You can download an episode, you can listen to it at work, or not at work, but on the way to work. While you're exercising, while you're taking a walk, while you're you know, cooking dinner, it's not live, so it has this timeless aspect to it. It's archived for forever. You have a chance to really edit and curate a story that has impact. You can really go deep. You can engage other voices. So to me, it was, it was really appealing for many, many reasons. But another reason it appealed is because it didn't have a gatekeeper. All it would take is me deciding to do it and sitting down and doing it. And so that year, my, my goal was to have no regrets. The next year, so I recorded my first episode that year, but a year later, I had not released it. It was just sitting on my laptop and waiting for me to do something with it, if you can believe it. And I was scared. I was a perfectionist. I wanted to have the perfect product before anything else was done. I wanted to have audio that was perfect and a website and all these things to be perfect before I took this risk. So the next year comes and my word for that year was done. Done is better than perfect. And I just decided, okay, this year I have to get it out. It, it can't sit on my laptop anymore. And so Uproot really came to be born that year. And when I was trying to find a name, I, I floated many, many ideas. Um, you know, live with Lily or life with Lily and all these things and they just did not resonate with me. And I really thought about my life and who are the people and the stories and who's become my community. Because when you are an Ethiopian immigrant, that's different than being an Ethiopian. When you are married to somebody who doesn't share your nationality, you, you relearn identity in new ways. When you're raising your kids within multiple different cultures, you then also realize, wow, you know, being uprooted is, is not easy, it's not um, hard, but it has been the case of the human condition since the beginning of time. The story of migration and movements is, is familiar to so many of us. But more than that, I think you know, my, my tagline is that we want to celebrate the roots that allow us to rise up. So for me, Uproot is both talking about these stories where you are in multiple cultures or identities or you're wrestling with different parts of who you are, but also to celebrate and remember where you came from. So when I was thinking about the name and the idea of being uprooted, obviously it has a bit of a negative connotation and I really wanted to redefine it. So I ran it by lots of girlfriends and they gave me all kinds of advice. My best friend Ruth and I actually came up with the name and we were going to, I was going to call it The Uproot, which sounded like, no, that's a fixed one-time event and that's not the story I'm telling. I want to tell stories about people who are in process, you know, have gone through it, whatever. So another friend of mine, Regine, said, why don't you put a slash between the up and the root, you know, kind of change what people look at when they see it and they can see this idea of moving upwards, but also this connection to our roots. And so it's still evolving. I think I have so many more stories to tell, but in the last year, just the growth process for me has been incredible. It reminds me of really having a newborn where I have not slept as much as I need to, but the joy that I feel and just having either just conducted an interview or having a new idea and sitting with it all night, it just has brought me a joy that I didn't expect. Um, and so all the sleepless nights and kind of the uncertainty and all the mistakes that I've made along the way are also have been such a gift. And to me, the privilege is always people sharing their personal stories because that's what we have. That's the commodity that all of us hold dearly and that's unique to each one of us is our story. And on Uproot, I think for me, it's been really important to 
allow those personal stories to be told in the way that they want it to be told. So I pitched an idea to UNICEF about visiting Kakuma refugee camp and talking to students there, which is back to one of my loves of working with kids, and asking them, what does it mean to be a refugee? Do you call each other refugees? Is that how you identify yourselves? And um, I tell you, it was, it was, for me, I was the student in those conversations. I just sat and listened. And the power and the potential in that place could change the world. Um, and only by the lottery of birth have these children ended up in a refugee camp as opposed to Nairobi University or at you know, State House Girls. It's only because they were born to certain parents in a certain country. Um, I've also had the privilege of interviewing people who I think are really leading justice movements in different ways. So I talked to Wanjira Mathai, who's the chair of the Wangari Mathai Foundation and the daughter of our beloved Wangari Mathai. And she talked about what it meant to have a legacy, what it means to build the legacy for the next generation and make sure that the work of her mother does not die now, that it continues, that it endures, that we remember why it's important, that we each do our own little thing. I talked to Latanya Mapfret, who is the CEO of the Global Fund for Women, who talked about what it meant to be a modern day feminist. She's an African American woman, so what does it mean to be a black woman leading an international organization talking about feminism and also making sure that the issues of girls and women are central to any policy conversation, any government agenda, and, and what it's cost her. I think sometimes what we don't always see about leadership and activism is the tremendous cost that these people pay to ensure more access for the rest of us. So Latanya's conversation was one that blew me away, just blew me away by her dedication to the cause of, for, for women and girls, and she's really pursued that her entire life. Season three is coming up, and I have lots of exciting things on the horizon. Um, I have conversations coming up with um, Ilud Kipchoge and him talking about what it has meant for him in this last year to be on such a global stage and the advice he offers to us, what we can do day to day to pursue our potential. Um, I have conversations coming up about children who learn differently and how do they succeed. And maybe we have a very narrow definition of success. I have a conversation coming up about global parenting. You know, what do we do when we're raising kids and we have this generational difference about issues around drugs or or just manners, simple manners. How do we raise our kids today with the values that might be from a different generation? Right, I think it, it comes not just in election cycles, but throughout uh, time and the, the arc of political conversations. Probably the, the greatest joy really is after the live shows, is having that moment where somebody comes up to say, thank you for sharing this story, or thank you for, I feel more connected, I feel heard, or I feel seen. I think for me, that's been, an unexpected gift because I think you you start off these things and you just wonder is anybody listening does it matter does it does it does it matter at all that's been a huge joy and then recently I did an episode about orphanage tourism and how our good intentions of trying to care for children who are vulnerable oftentimes is not the best practice and that has been an unexpected joy because people have reached out to me afterwards and said I listened to the story about two people who had grown up in institutions in Kenya and because of that story I am asking more questions of my church, of my school, of organizations about why are we involved in orphanages if 80 to 90 percent of the kids there have a living parent. All I can do is tell a story. That's my only skill, you know. I'm not a, a politician, I'm not a writer, I'm not all these other things. I, I am a storyteller and so if that storytelling can create more justice in the world, really I can um, I can rest. What makes you different from a Ugandan or a Tanzanian or whomever, you know, who actually ethnically and a lot of times we actually overlap? Um, I still have big story, big hopes and dreams. Uh, Uproot is a podcast, but I hope it will grow into other mediums. I still have my, my Oprah dreams in the back of my mind and being able to engage with people in person is really important. And I hope one of the impacts that I can make is just to allow people to dream and pursue their dreams and say, you know, yes, life is busy. But if you have that one thing, for me, honestly, that one thing is sto storytelling and connecting with others. Like, honestly, that's my only gift. I am not good at anything else. I think as a, as a, as a woman in particular, it's always important that we're, we're reaching back and bringing other women along with us as much as we can. And I've had an incredible group of people who have helped support me. There's so many friends I've called on who are editors who have said, please edit this episode for me and you know, look at it and, and think about this. And, as much as it's hard to ask women for help, I've just been amazed at how we will rise to the challenge every time. Every time. I mean, there's a real sisterhood, I think, in so many 
of these places if we just ask, if we just make ourselves vulnerable to say, I need help. And among the millions of refugees worldwide who have been uprooted from their countries, over 28 million of them are children. I remember at the beginning of this year on Twitter, there was a conversation about all of these under, top 30 under 30 lists or top 25 under 25 lists. And somebody on Twitter said, you know, can you give us the list of like the top 50 under 50 or the women in their 40s who decide to pursue their dreams? And I think we need more stories like that because most of what I've seen in this year of building this podcast is that oftentimes I'm the oldest person in the room, which I don't mind. I feel like that age has brought me some, some wisdom and maybe I have something to offer that's different in a very young media space. But I would just say to all of us, whether you're you know, a mother with young kids or if you're a 47 year old professional who's just considering a career change, there's no other time better than now. And there's nothing that we don't have that the world doesn't need. So for all of us, I think it's time. It's time to, to really pursue whatever passions we have. Mm -hmm.